I guess we'll go ahead and get started. There's more seats up front if you'd like. No one ever People don't realize if you sit up front, I don't take on you. All right, well, uh, we'll go ahead and get started. And good morning, everyone. Welcome to Gettysburg National Military Park. My name is Nick Lorenz, and it is an honor to have you here with us. Um, a little bit about myself before we get started here. I, uh, I actually graduated right down the street here at uh, Gettysburg College. I now hold a degree in theater arts, which pretty much means that I am absolutely useless to the American public, <laughs> um, with the exception of doing programs like this. Now, the program that you're about to go on today is called A Visit to the Past. And the main purpose of this program is to try and take you from modern-day 2010 back into 1863, more specifically back to one specific day in 1863. That day is going to be November 19, 1863, a very important day here in Gettysburg history and American history as well. We'll talk about why. Um, now, on top of that, it's important to remember some things because we're going back into 1863, the first of which is actually the day. The day is going to be November 19th. You need to remember that, folks. Please, please, please remember that day in your heads. The other thing that you need to remember is that as of this very moment, you all now work for the New York Times. You've all been recruited to work for the New York Times in 1863. So no matter what your opinions are of the New York Times today, please remember it's a different paper back in 1863. Now, on top of that, uh, there are other things that you need to remember. The first of which is that if you are from a southern state, I need to apologize. Uh, and the simple fact of the matter is that you work for a northern paper now. We're going to make fun of the South. I apologize in advance. You need to remember that it's not me saying these things about the South. It is a man in 1863. Who, who works for a northern paper. Needless to say, there's going to be a few harsh feelings there. Now, the other thing you need to remember is that the person that I'm going to be portraying, while he does work for the Times in our modern-day society here, the fact is he's not actually a real reporter. He's a fictional character. And that is because a lot of people come back to Gettysburg around this time of year, and they don't like it when I portray their relatives. I couldn't even tell you why. But oftentimes, the line that I hear is, that's not what my grandfather would have said. Um, and I'll actually be reading out of his diary. Needless to say, uh, I don't like getting in arguments anymore, so therefore he is not a real person. Everything that he's going to tell you is going to be real. It's just that he's not the one who said it. So please don't go looking him up. Now there's one other final warning that I need to give everyone here, and it has to do with the fact that back in 1863, they do not have a lot of the modern-day technology that we possess here in 2010. Which means, if you have anything that's going to make noise, like say a cell phone, a uh, beeper, pager, small child, if you could turn it to silent mode, you would be doing everyone a huge favor. So I will give you time to do that real quick. And I'm going to take one last one. Here. All right. Everyone's taken care of. All right. Well, we'll go ahead and get started. Give me one second. We'll take off. What are we doing? I am so sorry I'm late. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, please. Friends, I apologize. We need to get started right away. Uh, I'm sure everyone knows who I am, yes? I'm sorry. I'm a little flustered here. Uh, whew. Need to breathe. Get in here! You're late! Sit down! Where are you from, sir? Uh, uh, Glastonbury, <laughs> Connecticut. Um, um, Connecticut? Yeah. I am ashamed of Connecticut! <laughs> That's your warning there. Now sit down. Now, I'm sure everyone knows who I am, yes? Christopher Winslow. Uh, and who do we work for, friends? Yeah. Thank you. That was one of the most unenthusiastic New York Times I've ever had in my life. One of the most unenthusiastic. Who do we work for? New York Times! A little bit better. All right. Well, we'll get, we have to go ahead and get started here. Now, uh, I'm assuming some of the other classmates are late, too. Maybe they'll arrive. Maybe they won't. Uh, as a result of that, I'm assuming also those, those of you are, that are here are good students, and you have read the material that I submitted to everyone. Everyone read the pamphlet, correct? If you read the pamphlet, we can cut off a good three hours from our talk uh, today. Did everyone read it? Yeah. 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 Everyone read yeah. the pamphlet. Excellent. Yeah. That's what I want to hear. Now, as you are such good students, I am going to go ahead and quiz you over the material that you should have studied, all right? Uh, so the first question I have is, what is the first rule to being a good reporter? Does anyone know? What is it? First rule. Raise your hand. Tell the truth. Objectivity. You, you need to raise your hand, but wait until I call on you. Good job. <laughs> What was it, sir? Tell the truth. Tell the truth. No. That's not the first one. What is the first one? Yeah. Objectivity. Objectivity. No. No, that's not the Yes, sir. Write a flamboyant story. Write a flamboyant... Sir, what? <laughs> Connecticut? Tell their new Stand up, sir. Stand up. Stand up. That was the worst rule I've ever heard. <laughs> Walk out the tent. <laughs> Sit down, sir. You need to learn. Now, so, yes, sir, in the back. Sell newspapers. That's, that's a necessity. That's not a rule, sir. If you don't sell papers, we don't have a job. What is it? Make up stories. Make up Sir, we do not work for the Herald. <laughs> Come on. What is the first? You are supposed to be good. 
good students. What's the first rule to being a good or boy? Someone, yes. Get the print on time. It's not get the print on time. <laughs> no. What is it? It's the first rule. The most important rule to being a good reporter. What is it? Good spelling. Good spelling. <laughs> Madam? Do you want to stand up or should I get the photo? Yeah. Yes. Get the facts straight. Get the facts straight. No. Where are you? Oh, yes, in the back. I have a story to report. That has to do with it, but no. Exaggerate. It's Sir, <laughs> I, I, lest I remind you that we do not work for the Herald again. We do not work for the Herald. Now, I am ashamed of you. This is the most important rule of being a good reporter. And it has to do with one... Let me ask you a question. Maybe this will lead you to the answer. It's two words, friends. Two words. How can you report the news if you're not there? What's the first rule? Be there. Be there. Thank you! Good heavens! Thank you! There is a God, sir! Thank you! The bright, shining spot in the sea of idiots over here. <laughs> I'm afraid to ask you, morons, but what's the second rule to being a good reporter? Tell, tell the truth. Is that, not tell the truth! <laughs> good heavens, no. No one said it so far. Yes, ma'am. Live to write it. Live to write it. Madam, a dead reporter is not a good reporter. <laughs> <laughs> so, no. It's not the, what, what, what is the second rule? It has to, come, come on, someone has to know the answer here. These are the easiest two rules in the world, friends. Yes. Write it down. Write it. <laughs> Sir, we talked about necessities. That would be a necessity. No, this has to do during interviews. What are you doing during interviews, friends? What are you doing? You ask questions. You ask questions. Thank you, boy. You didn't raise your hand, but I'm going to let it slide because you got it right. <laughs> ask questions. Two rules, friends. Two rules were the only thing you had to memorize. Be there and ask questions. I am ashamed of every last one of you. Good heavens. None of you read the material, did you? None of them. Good, oh. good God. <laughs> why do I always get the worst reporters? Why do, I, why do I get the worst recruits? This is awful, friends. We need to keep going here. Uh, has everyone here, I'm assuming that I need to take the time out to tell you that this is a very dangerous profession, friends. The fact is you're going to be putting your life in the line every single day. Every single day, friends. And it's mainly because of where we report from. Does everyone know where we report from as reporters right now? Where do we report from? New York. Oh, well, we are from New York. Yes, but where? <laughs> Yes. Are. Yeah, we report at the war. So we, you are going to be battlefield reporters, ge uh, gents, gentlemen and ladies. <laughs> the fact of the matter is, friends, as such, it's a very dangerous job. Now, people tend to think of that for one reason. What is the one most dangerous thing out there? Anyone know? Guns. Well, y yes, but what comes flying at you? <laughs> well, that's, that's what people would say, is that the most dangerous thing you're going to face on a battlefield is a bullet, friends. Let me tell you, I disagree wholeheartedly. Uh, the fact is, for some reason, people in this, in this army do not like us. Uh, I couldn't tell you why, but the generals themselves and the officers are men that I would say are your main primary concern, friends. They don't like us for some reason. I couldn't even tell you why. Now, is everyone familiar with the Western Front of the war? The Western Front that we have going on. Everyone's familiar, yes? Yeah. General yeah. Grant out there, he's, he's, he's fighting on the Western Front. There's a man under his command who absolutely hates us reporters. Does anyone know who I'm talking about? Kind of an insane man. He's from Ohio. Sherman. General Sherman. Yes, ironic that I, you knew the answer once I told you his habits. <laughs> the fact that General Sherman is a little, a little bit crazy. The fact is he hates us reporters so much that he put out a warning through all of his cats. He said if he found one of us reporters, there was going to be something to pay. Uh, needless to say, he did find a man in his cat. As punishment, he court-martialed this man, tried him for being a traitor and a spy to the Union cause, and convicted him. Now, as punishment, friends, uh, just to warn you, he took this man tied him to the back of an artillery wagon. Everyone knows what that is, yes? Mm -hmm. An artillery wagon with the, with the cannons and whatnot. Mm -hmm. Ties him to the back of this wagon and proceeded to parade him around the camp. Uh, as if that wasn't bad enough, though, friends, the marching band got involved, and they started playing the Rogue's March. And now everyone knows what happens after they play the Rogue's March, correct? Something happens. What is it? Execution. Something, someone dies. Usually someone gets shot. And the fact is that this man, they, they put him up against the wall. They had a firing squad ready, and General Sherman said, Take your guns. Ready? Aim. Hold your fire. Uh, needless to say, friends, he could breathe a sigh of relief, uh, but I'm sure that that man needed a new pair of pads as well. Uh, <laughs> the fact is, he was let go after that. It was enough of a scare. Needless to say, like I said, reporters do not like us, friends. Everyone's familiar with the Eastern Front here. I know most of you are from Eastern States, it looks like. Um, now, does anyone know who was in charge of this army before General Meade was here at Gettysburg? Hooker. Yes, General Hooker. Now, General Hooker, he's an example of a person who used to love us reporters. For example, if, if I went up to General Hooker and said, General Hooker, what are you going to do tomorrow? And he said, well, we're going to move our men off to the far right flank here. We're going to catch the enemy off guard. We're going to surprise attack them by morning. 
Now, he loved us, and I, I would write that down. If I sent that into the paper the next day, he was very angry at me. Um, I couldn't tell you why, friends. <laughs> couldn't tell you why. He says that we're traitors and spies to the war. Uh, he says the Confederates, their only job is to come up here into the North and to read our papers. They will know exactly what's going to happen for the entire day. Uh, but I have an argument against that, friends. And that is, how many Confederates do you know that can read? <laughs> because I know of none, friends, to be honest. Now, uh, let's move on. Now, uh, General Hooker, just to give you a little bit of insight about him, again, he turned on us, like I said, he used to love us. For example, uh, we would write about him every single day in the paper. It got to the point, though, where we ran out of war stories, friends. And as such, what did I do? I started writing about his personal life. And, uh, of course, you women will, will note that General Hooker is a very handsome man, and uh, a lot of younger girls uh, would agree with you. A lot of younger girls started following General Hooker around. I started taking notice of these women and wrote about them, and I called them Hooker's girls. Uh, <laughs> he didn't like that. I can't imagine why, friends. Uh, but nonetheless. Now, let's move on. Uh, so, let's, let's talk about this specific battle of Gettysburg. Does anyone know how many reporters we had covering this specific battle? It's a number. Are you more on something? It's a number. How many? How many digits? Four. Two th yes, 2,000, my friend. No. <laughs> An army of reporters? Where are you getting your facts, boy? Four. Four? Four? No. No, I mean on both sides. Both sides. How many facts? Twenty. It's not a hundred, but it's about half of that, which means how many? Fifty! Thank you. <laughs> yeah. The fact is we had about fifty men covering this battle for both sides. Now, how many of you, uh, well, first of all, how many do you believe were from the north of those fifty? Forty-nine. Just about fifty. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we covered that was just about fifty. The simple fact of the matter is that there are about forty-five of us who were from the north, which leaves how many for the south, friends? Five. Uh, At least you can do subtraction. Good, you have one more little skill. Excellent. Now, the fact is that we had five men covering this battle for the southern field here. Now, the fact of the matter is, though, that the Confederate Army, they have a very strict rule that they tend to adhere to, friends. I'm not sure if you're familiar with this, uh, but the Army of Northern Virginia, the Confederates over there, they say that only one type of man can travel in the Army that's not enlisted. Does anyone know what type of man that is? A surgeon. Not a surgeon. Not a doctor. Half what is it? A chaplain? Not a clergyman. No. Five. What? A spy. <laughs> no. <laughs> where, where are these children from? <laughs> a cook. No, 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 no. Someone. Undertaker. No, no, no. Good God. You people are morons. <laughs> let, me, let me spell it out for you, friends. What's the name of the army over there? The Confederate. The Confederate. Yes, sir. It is the Confederate army. It's the Rebel army. But the fact is they have a name for it. It's called the Army of Northern Virginia. What type of man can travel with the Army of Northern Virginia? Virginian. Thank you. <laughs> Good heaven. This is not that difficult, friends. A Virginian man is the only one allowed to travel with the Army of Northern Virginia. Now, as such, friends, I believe that some of the facts you might have learned about this battle have been slightly distorted. Is anyone familiar with the third day's events here? There's a very large scale event on the third day. Does anyone know what it is? Pickets. Pickets charge. There's a charge. Exactly right. There's a very large scale charge that happens on the field. Now, the simple fact of the matter is that three men led that charge. Can anyone name those three men for me? Yes, sir. Lee. Not General Lee. Uh, Pickett. Pickett is one of them. Who were the other two? Longstreet. Mr. Pettigrew. Not General Longstreet. No. Armistead. Armistead was under General Pickett. No. Yes. Yes, thank you. Trimble. Pickett, Pettigrew, and Trimble. Ironically, two of you knew the other two names. Uh, good heavens. The fact of the matter is three men led the charge, friends. Three of them. Uh, now, who got all the credit? Pickett. General Pickett did. Where is he from? Virginia. Virginia, friends. Mm -hmm. They gave the Virginian all the credit for leading that charge over there when three men led the charge. Uh, Mr. Trimble, Mr. Pettigrew were from North Carolina, Tennessee, respectively. Needless to say, they gave all the credit for the Virginian or the blame in those cases as well, but... Uh, well, let's move on here. Now, as I said, of the five men reporting for the Confederacy over there, one of them was not actually even of this country, friends. He wasn't even from this country. Does anyone know where he's from? Ireland. He's from England. Exactly right. He's from England. And which paper? Does anyone know? The best paper in the whole wide world. The London Times. Uh, the London Times, friends. The London Times, the greatest paper in the world, sent over a man here to cover our war. Now, as such, he was given the opportunity to follow either north or south. He chose to follow the Confederates, friends. Shows to follow them. And uh, now I like to say that's for a very specific reason. I like to say the British people love four things in this world. Does anyone know what those four things are? P. T, yes. Fi five is, is alcohol. Oh, but no, it didn't make the top four. What is it? Cotton. Cotton, yes. Tobacco. Teen, cotton, tobacco, and... 
Slaves? <laughs> no! The crown does not like slavery. What was that? What was that number? Someone? Three things. So we have tea, cotton, tobacco, and... Nope. Money. Money, friends. I love money. The fact of the matter is alcohol is number five. I can't include that on the list, though. The fact is, four top four things they love. Tea, they get from someplace else. Money, they make their own or they steal it every other place that they can. Uh, what do they get from our Confederate states? Cotton. And? Cotton. 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 Where in this country do we make tea? No. Good heavens, no. We got cotton and tobacco from us, the two major exports from the Confederacy. He's following them to keep those trade lines open. Now, on top of that, friends, as if that's not bad enough, though, he is actually writing very sympathetically about the Confederates, friends. Very sympathetically, to the point that he is trying to drum up support from England to have them send over troops. British people are trying to do that, friends. They're trying to convince the Queen to send over and aid the, the Confederacy. God help us, friends, if that happens. God help us. Pray to God that it doesn't, because I do not believe that we will make it out of this war alive. Alright, now, let's move on. Now, as I said, we have 45 men here for the Union reporting. Now, as such, how many do you believe were from the Times here? How many of us were, from, were here for the Times? All of them. Not, not 45. No, we do not have that much money, friends. Not at all. I'll, I'll give you a clue. It's less than five. It's in between two and two and four. <laughs> Thank you. Good heavens. I am surrounded by idiots. <laughs> Needless to say, we have three men covering this battle. For those of you that do not know what's in between two and four. Uh, three. Three of us were here covering this battle. Now, has everyone been on the field itself? Yes. For those of you that have been on the field, for, for those of you who haven't, this is a warning. You need to get out there and you need to see what happened here. But the other, those of you that have been here, for those of you that have seen the field, someone give me an adjective to describe the size of this field. Huge. Huge, Huge immense, large. It Big is enormous. Massive. For three of us to cover this field was incredibly difficult, friends. I'm just going to tell you right now, we had to split up. We sent a man over here, one towards the middle of the line, one all the way at the other end of the line. It was very difficult for us to get our news and communicate. Mm -hmm. Problem was, other papers sent more men. Uh, the New York Tribune, uh, first of all, do we like the Tribune from New York? Uh -huh. We do, actually. <laughs> <laughs> They're good men. We do know their editor. You are allowed to associate. I admire your, <laughs> your will to, to hate everyone, but no, we do like the Tribune. The fact is, uh, they are good men. We do know their editor. You are allowed to share facts with the Tribune. Not too many, though. Now, on top of that, they sent five men down here. It was a little bit easier for them to communicate. They did have more men. Now, one paper, friends, one paper from New York sent down ten men to this battle. Does anyone know which paper that is? The Herald. It was a Herald. <laughs> now, do we like the Herald? No. no! No, we do not! Words cannot express my disdain for the Herald. And we, we will understand why in a moment here. But nonetheless, they had ten men, friends. Ten men to cover this battle here. Now, as such, you would believe that they should have the most accurate paper. However, for those of you that read the 4th of July editions of all three of our papers, who was, who, who was the most accurate? Time. Time. It was us! It was us. And I will tell you right now, friends, it surprised me. It surprised me for three of us uh, to, to be more accurate than the Herald, who had ten men. Ridiculous. Nonetheless, the fact is, if you read the Herald paper on the 4th of July, they claim the battle was still ongoing here. Uh, does anyone know how many, how many days the battle lasted? Three. Just three. <laughs> on the 1st, 2nd, and 3rd of July, they said the battle was still going on on the 4th. They said generals were off of their horses, stabbing each other with sabers. They made up these nonsensical stories. Friends said there was another charge. They got away with it. Does anyone know why? Because nobody's there telling the difference. Well, no one's there telling the difference. That's true, but mainly one other reason. Money? Well, essentially, what, is, what, is that, what does that money mean? They can sell more papers. They sell more papers, friends. Papers. That's exactly right. The reason they made up these stories was to sell more papers. Does anyone know how much their paper costs? One, one, cent. one, one measly cent. Needless to say, our paper costs three. They need to sell three of every one of their papers to make up for one of us. Now, the problem came, if you read our 4th of July edition, we were not completely <coughs> accurate either. We did make one mistake, and I said the death of General Longstreet of Mississippi. Now, did he die, friends? No. Everyone should have said no astoundingly. <laughs> I just told you that was an incorrect fact. <laughs> the simple fact of the matter is that General Longstreet did not die here. I was given that fact by another paper. And who was that? The it was the Herald, friends. <laughs> it was the Herald. And needless to say, these Herald boys, they gave me that fact. And, of course, I wrote that up. I took full responsibility for it. But now, this is a very important part of our, our talk this morning. I want you to, to listen to the quote of President Lincoln here. He said to me one time, he said, Chris, whatever you are, be a good one. Whatever you are, be a good one, friends. Take that to heart because I want you to be the best reporter that you can be. However, I want you to realize that the boys of the Herald also take that quote to heart because they are by far the best drunks 
I have ever seen on a battlefield. Uh, if you like spending your days lounging around the field drinking, then they're the crew for you, friends. Uh, but, now, let's move on. Now, uh, does anyone have any questions about reporting during the battle? During the battle. I am ashamed. You people, this is awful. What's the second rule of being a good reporter? Uh, At least you've learned that so far. What, 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 you had a question, sir. Uh, how far in advance they know that there's going to be a battle? We don't, sir. <laughs> back to that the day of the battle, we actually arrived late. We were down uh, down in Tan Tan, Maryland, about 10 or 15 miles away. We had to ride up this way. We did not even get here until later on in the afternoon, which is why the two rules come into place, Francis. You need to be there as fast as you can, but on top of that, you're not always going to make it in time, which means you need to ask questions. Uh, ask questions. You can reconstruct what you what you imagine happened that way. How so, close to the front line? It's a very good question I get very often. The fact is that is your own discretion. But like I said before, a dead reporter is not a good reporter. <laughs> uh, therefore, uh, you want to be safe, friend. A lot of people climb trees. Uh, I myself am not a climber. I would stick to the high ground towards the cannons. Where I, you get the best view of the field. You do. And then afterwards what we do is, of course, interview men in the hospitals, things like that. Ask them for their stories. It makes very good writing. Now, the other question I have for everyone here is, uh, does anyone know what the lightning is? Everyone should know what the lightning is. Not the stuff in the sky, Pennsylvanians. You can already see that in your eyes. Oh, it's a brigade? What is it? It's a brigade? Name of not, a, not a brigade, no. What is the lightning? Yes? Campfire. Not the campfire, no. Cannon flash. Not a cannon flash, no, friends. Wow. Good heavens, this is ridiculous, friends. Telegraph. We also call it the wire? Oh. Telegraph. Thank you, friends, the telegraph. <laughs> <laughs> the telegraph. Now, here's a question for you. Does every small town here in the north have a telegraph? No. no. Yes. yes, friends. We are not down south. <laughs> we are not in the Stone Age. Every small town's got a telegraph. Good heavens. The fact of the matter is, though, friends, uh, if you look at the second and third days of this battle here, who controls the town? The south. The Confederates. The enemy has control of the town. What do we have to do? We have to pay men to ferry out our, our couriers out uh, elsewhere. We, we would write up our transmissions. They would take them to other towns and send them out for us. It was very difficult for us. Uh, a lot of smaller papers ended up saving their transmissions until after the battle was over, and then they sent them out once we had control of the town. So that's what they did. Now, the other question I have is how many reporters were killed during this battle? How many Three. None. <laughs> Very tricky question, friends. None. Absolutely none. How many civilians? One. One. What's your name? One. Excuse me, madam, I heard you say, what was her name? Jenny Wade. Jenny Wade? No. That is, her name is not Jenny. Oh, Virginia. Her name is Virginia. Virginia. Yeah. Virginia Mary Wade, friends. Now, madam, you said Jenny. That makes me think that you're a southerner. Uh, <laughs> yes, apparently you've been hanging out with southerners. We'll, we'll talk yeah, about that later. That but the fact of the matter is that Miss Virginia Mary Wade, she was the only civilian killed during this battle. Does anyone know how? How was she killed, anyone? Stray bullet. That's what everyone's... Oh, let me tell you this amazingly good story that I've heard to tell. Uh, let me see if I can make it dramatic enough. Oh, Miss Virginia Mary Wade, oh, she's baking bread for these Union soldiers, and she's taking it out of the oven, and she's placing these biscuits out on the porch there, so that way these men have something to eat. And good God, a Confederate sees her, a sharpshooter, and he points his gun directly at her, and he fires, and oh, good God, just as she's closing the door, the bullet goes through not one, but two doors, and it kills her, and it's such a sad story. And good God, friends. <laughs> Don't believe a word of it. If you hear that story, just run away. <laughs> the fact of the matter is, friends, first of all, has anyone here tried to shoot a bullet through a door? Just me? <laughs> just me. All right. Well, the first fact of the matter is, will the bullet go through the first door? No. Yeah. Yeah. No. Uh, yeah, if you said yes, you have a very awful door. <laughs> very awful door. No one has a door that bad unless you're down south, friends. Uh, the fact of the matter is that we in the north, everyone has a very thick door. The bullet will not go through the first door, which means it sure as heck isn't going to go through the second door. As such, friends, I do not believe that's how she was killed. I believe that a stray bullet, as, as many of you know, the town's windows were all blown out. A bullet probably hit the windowsill, ricocheted in. Now, the other fact of the matter is that no one was aiming for her, of course. But, but if we look at the facts, I do not necessarily believe that she was a union supporter, friends. And, and people that I've talked to in town would agree with me. They said they weren't too sad to see her go. I'd uh, be perfectly honest about Miss Virginia Mary Wade. Now, on top of that, friends, if we look at the facts, if she is indeed making these biscuits and, and putting them outside on the, on the porch here, who is getting the biscuits, friends? Because she dies on the second or third day. Which means the enemy, the Confederates, are getting these biscuits. She is aiding the enemy, friends. She's aiding the enemy. Now, on top of that, what's her first, first name? Virginia. Virginia, friends. <laughs> Virginia, a state in the Confederacy. Needless to say, in my mind, she is the Confederate supporter, friends. Confederate support. Now, uh, another thing that I've heard in town, I'm not sure if this is a rumor or not, but people in town that I talk to say that she might have been a woman of good repute, friends. 
Uh, not the type of woman you want to bring home to your mother, boys, to say the least of things. Uh, so, nonetheless, that, that was her story. I am not sure what will happen to her, but... Now, let's move on. Now, did I, I'm sure everyone read the paper on the 4th of July here. The problem being, if you read the paper, does anyone know what the headline would have been on the 4th? The war is over. Not, not the headline. Lee retreats. Not even. The battle is over. It wasn't even anything to do with Gettysburg, friends, to be honest. <laughs> it's Independence It was Vicksburg. It was Vicksburg because Vicksburg was a siege, friends, and it was it was longer, of course, and as such, they did get the headlines. However, they do coincide on the same day we did get headlines on the 4th as well. Now, um, we, we, what ha happened here at the battle here, it was very easy for us in the North to claim victory. I'm not sure if you, you realize this, but the numbers do fall in our favor, friends. As such, we do claim victory. We, about 28,000 Confederates die here, or are listed as casualties. 28,000 men. 23,000 Union men are listed as casualties. The numbers do fall in our favor. We do claim victory that way. However, for those of you that are familiar with, uh, with military terms, General Lee performs a maneuver. Does anyone know what it's called? Retreat. It's a retreat. <laughs> when you retreat off the battle, when you leave the field, that means you lost the battle, in my personal opinion. As such, it was very easy for us to claim victory. The problem being, friends, when General Lee and the Confederates left the field of battle, they left all of their dead bodies in their wake. And needless to say, friends, there were close to 10,000 dead men on the field, strewn about everywhere. The problem being, of course, our Union boys had to pick up camp and, of course, follow them back down to the south. What they managed to do was leave a few men behind here to start digging up temporary graves in our boys. And what they did for our Union boys is if, if, if they would dig a hole in the ground, probably about 8 inches deep, not even a full foot, put the body in there. They would label it as best they can. But again, friends, we have no standardized way of telling who a man is. If a man does not have a letter in his pocket, or his name sewn somewhere, or if he isn't wearing a state button, or a state belt buckle, we don't even know where he's from. Which, as a result of which, a lot of our men go unknown, friends. We put them in the ground, we put a little headstone here, we threw some dirt on top of them, we left them there. Now, does anyone know what we did with those Confederates? That would have been easier, but no, we did not burn the Confederates. What did we do? Mass race, exactly right, madam. Over on their side of the field, they were the enemy, friends. We put them over there, big ditch, threw their bodies in there, we left them there. Now, the problem came, friends, we, a lot of our boys did not label those graves. They were punished if they were labeled them. As such, I only know where one of those graves is over there. Uh, on the Confederate side of the field, there's a little sign out there that says 45 Confederates in between these two trees. That's the only way they are identified. Now, on top of that, though, the problem is, on the 4th of July, something very awful happened here. Does anyone know what happened? It rained. That's putting it mildly, friends. It rained so bad that I thought no was coming back, just to give you an idea. Uh, it was so horrible. The fact of the matter is that rain is just pounding on the ground, torrential downpours. A lot of people don't realize this, but a lot of our men were still on the field. A lot of our wounded men, there's actually a small stream out there in the field there. A lot of our boys had crawled over the stream while refilling their canteens, trying to survive until the surgeons and medics could get out there, of course. They get out there, they're filling up their canteens, the water began to rise so quickly that a lot of our boys couldn't escape that. A lot of them drowned before we could even get to them. As if that's not bad enough, though, friends, the torrential rain is just pounding away at the ground. It washes away all the dirt that's on top of these bodies, exposes the Union dead. As if that's not bad enough, of course, the holes themselves start filling with water. So they, the bodies start rising. Now we have a bunch of floating Union bodies in these shallow graves. It's disgusting, friends. Now that's not even the worst part. Because, of course, the next day, the sun comes out, and if you've ever been to the Pennsylvania in the heat of July, friends, you know that it gets very hot around here very fast. Needless to say, the sun starts cooking the ground and cooking these bodies. They start swelling up to two and three times their size. It is disgusting. The stench is horrific. Of course, everyone can imagine the, the smell of the live horse. Everyone smell the horse, correct? The live horse? How, how good does a horse smell? Very, pretty bad. To be honest, there are 3,000 dead horses on the field as well, friends. 3,000 dead horses on top of this 10,000 bodies. It's disgusting. Uh, it was so bad that the governor of Pennsylvania came down here. He said that Gettysburg was in a state of emergency. said we have to do something about all of these bodies. And he put one man in charge. Local lawyer and a prominent politician in town here. A man by the name of David Wills. Uh, who some of you might have heard of. It was his responsibility to find a place to put a cemetery. So Mr. Wills looked around the entire field, looked around, tried to find some place, and of course, he found a little spot over there on this little hill over there. It's called Cemetery Hill. Does anyone know why it's called Cemetery Hill? <coughs> cemetery there. There's, there's a cemetery there. <laughs> it's very easy questions, I told you, friends. The fact of the matter is it was the town cemetery, the local town cemetery, Evergreen Cemetery is up there on that hill. That is why it's called Cemetery Hill. Now, on top of that, friends, what he does, he buys the rest of the land out there, decides to make that the National Cemetery. 
and he puts out a contract to see who can move all of the bodies from over here on the field to up there in the cemetery. Now the man who won that contract, does anyone know how much he said he would move every single body for? The per body price, friends. <coughs> A little bit more than a dollar. $1.50. About a dollar fifty or so. Round about a dollar fifty nine, round about side yourself. The problem <coughs> being, friends, do you think that this man moved any of these bodies? No. Absolutely not. Abs absolutely not. He's a smart man after all, an, an entrepreneur, <laughs> an American. He hired a crew to do it for him. And of course they hired a crew about ten to twelve of these freed slave boys who would come up this way, uh, jockey boys. It was their job to go ahead and start digging graves for these men. And of course what did they do? Have you seen how they move these boys? I'll tell you real quick. If you have it. The fact of the matter is, you will see them out there still today. Uh, and of course, they have these hooks about waist level here, about three foot long, about, about shaped like a big S or like a C. And what they'll do, they'll come up to a body that's, that's already exhumed out of the ground. They'll hook the body around through the ankles or the wrists, the extremities, hook them, lift up. The problem being, friends, um, we do not start moving these bodies until August to September. Uh -huh. When was the battle? July. July. These bodies have been on the field now for over a month, friends. Sitting in the heat, enduring the elements, enduring animals that have been gnawing at their carcasses, it is disgusting. When they lift up on these boys, a lot of times they are not staying together. Not staying together at all. They throw them into pine boxes. Now, how much do you think that these boys get paid? It is also a per body price. 50 cents. Uh, not even. 15 10 to 15 cents, depending on the size of the body. Friends. Again, if, if the body falls apart, it's a smaller body. If you can see it together, it's a larger body. Now, the fact of the matter is that they do put them in the pine box. We start ferrying them up to the cemetery, and uh, Mr. Wills says, Stop! We cannot put these men on the ground. We do not have, we haven't dedicated the ground yet. It's not hollow ground. Of course, what he does, he starts planning an elaborate ceremony that's supposed to take place in October. Invites down the most famous speaker that we can think of, uh, the most prominent man in the entire country, of course. Who is it? Abraham. Abraham. Where are you people from? <laughs> Abraham Lincoln? Good God. Raise your hand if you think Abraham Lincoln's the greatest speaker in the country. Raise your hand. Be honest. More of you said that. I am ashamed of you all can leave right now. Good heavens. Does anyone know where Mr. Lincoln was born, first of all? Born in Kentucky. It's born in Kentucky, friends. Uh, he was raised in where? <coughs> Indiana. Indiana. <laughs> Moved to Illinois. Again, I don't know why the man says he's from Illinois, to be honest. I don't know why. But the fact of the matter is he was raised in Indiana. Very poor man. Born in Kentucky. Speaks with a very thick southern accent, friends. He's the president of the United States, and he has a southern accent. Good God, it's awful. As if that's not bad enough, though, friends. For a man of some 50-odd years, he speaks very high for his age. I'm not sure if any of you have heard him speak before. The best compliment I can give Mr. Lincoln about his speaking voice is that he's the worst speaker I've ever heard in my life. And that's ever lived. Because uh, it's awful. Friends. It is God awful. It sounds like he is whining every time he opens his mouth. It is the worst speaking voice ever. Nonetheless, we did not invite down Mr. Lincoln. I don't know why you people would think that. But we invited down the most prominent man in the entire country. Does anyone know who I'm talking about? Senator. You. Senator? Not me. No. <laughs> While I do have prominence, I am not the most prominent man in the country. <laughs> Not, uh, Mr. Douglas has been dead for several years, sir. Seward? Not Mr. Seward. No, we did not invite him dead. Good, have, good God, you people are moronic. <laughs> moronic. Gentlemen, I'm especially ashamed of you. You all should remember this name. Man by the name of Edward Everett. Edward Everett, friends. Edward Everett. Senator right now. He's from what state? Does anyone know? Massachusetts? <laughs> <laughs> you people are, uh, this is ridiculous, friends. Gentlemen, you specifically should remember that man's name because of something we did less than three years ago, friends. Less than three years ago. What do we do? We do it every four years, gentlemen. What do we do? <laughs> Ironic that the women do, gentlemen, since they've never voted. <laughs> Not to say that you ladies didn't have a say in who your husbands voted for, necessarily. <laughs> I'm, so, I'm sure you'd be pretty convincing, but the fact of the matter is that, uh, that Gentlemen, you should remember that name. You voted in the election. And of course, mm -hmm. Mr. Everett should ring familiar because he was a vice presidential candidate back in 1860. Now, let me ask you this. Did he win? No. no he's not the vice president. <laughs> the simple fact of the matter is he did not win the election. And as such, you can hardly blame the man for not liking Mr. Lincoln too much. I myself wouldn't like the man who beat me in the election either. But nonetheless, we invited Mr. Everett down here first. He said he could not make it in October. He said he couldn't make it. His schedule was way too busy. He wrote back, he said, I'm sorry, I wish I could go, but I can't. Mr. Wills wrote back and said, 
Sir, we want you here so badly that we are willing to reorganize this entire ceremony around you. What day works for you? And of course, what day did he pick, friends? Today! Thank you! At least you know what day it is! <laughs> so why are we here today? Dedicate the we aren't here to hear him speak. We're here to dedicate the cemetery, friends. That's the most important thing we're here for. You might be here to hear Mr. Everett speak as well. Nonetheless, we invited him down. We set the entire ceremony around him. And two weeks before today's date, we did send a telegraph down to Washington area. Of course, who got it? Mr. Lincoln got it, of course. And his telegraph said, if you'd like to come down, that would be all right, sir. But we don't expect to see it. That's really the nicest thing you could say to the president. Of course, friends, the president does not leave the White House very often. Very rarely does he leave the White House. I, I actually don't feel comfortable with the president leaving the White House, to be honest. But uh, nonetheless, the fact is he decided he wanted to come up here and speak at this dedication and, and at least be present for it. Problem being, friends, I'm not sure if you read the paper recently, but there's a little bit of a controversy going on with Mr. Everett right, or Mr. Lincoln right now. Does anyone know? Something with his family. Yes. You know? What's that? His son? What? Son don't curse the man! His son hasn't died yet. No. His, his son has taken ill. His youngest boy, Tad. And for those of you that do not know Mr. Lincoln very well, he's already lost two of his four children, friends. Two of his four children. The third one just took ill. His wife, needless to say, was pleading with him. Don't go up to Gettysburg. It's always going to be there. It's just some podunk town in Pennsylvania. And of course, friends, uh, of course she's right. And of course, gentlemen, I'm sure just as you do occasionally, Mr. Lincoln ignores his wife. Comes up here anyway. Uh, writes a short speech at the White House or along the way, as I hear tell. Gets to Mr. Will's house this previous evening and says, I'd like to speak to him. Of course, we already talked about how great a speaker Mr. Lincoln is. Mr. Will said, I'm not so sure that's a good idea, sir. For several different reasons, though, friends. Of course, how long is the average speech in our day and age? An hour. An hour long. Is a good speech is an hour long. As such, how long is a short speech? Half an hour. Half an hour. 30 minutes, uh, 30 minutes, 25 at the bare minimum. Needless to say, he was worried about the length of the ceremony today. He said, if you're going to speak, keep it short. We knew Mr. Everett was going to speak for some time. Of course, as such, there was a very big party last night in town. All the pubs were open late. I myself was running late this morning. Uh, there was a parade up into the cemetery from the center of town. I ran up at the tail end of the parade and, and got up there just in time to hear Mr. Everett start speaking. But by the time I got there, my good friend Lorenzo Krauss, who works for us at the Times, had already started dictating his words. That was originally my job, uh, but he started dictating it. Started going on, said, as a tribute to him, I would do Mr. Lincoln. But, of course, Mr. Everett, he started speaking. How long did he speak for? Does anyone know? Over two hours. Over two hours. So over two hours. About, about two and a half hours. Uh, needless to say, Mr. Cross was not very happy with me by the time it was over. Uh, but nonetheless, the fact is, he sat down. Uh, how did the audience react to Mr. Everett's speech? Oh, standing ovation. It was incredible. It was, it, uh, there was more standing ovations than I've ever heard in my life. It was the loudest clapping I've ever heard. It was amazing. Amazing. The single greatest speech I've ever heard in my life. Of course, I had to pay attention to it. Uh, but nonetheless, the fact is that after that, a small band played, a choir sang. Mr. Lincoln arose and he began to speak. And of course, I took out my pad and paper and started writing down his words. And how soon after did he get done, friends? Ten minutes. Two. Ten minutes. Two. Two minutes, friends. <laughs> Two minutes. No sooner had I picked up my pad and, and written down words, he was done. And the fact is that, uh, what happened when he got done today? Anyone know? Um, hardly anything, anything really. Hardly anything at all. The man got finished, uh, and he began to sit down. And I will admit that I was the first person to stand up and start clapping because I was glad the man was done talking. <laughs> <laughs> sit down, Abe. But the fact of the matter is, he got done. Hardly anything even happened. Uh, most people didn't even clap for him until after he, he began to sit down. It was light applause. The fact is, uh, really no one that I talked to today liked it. Myself included. Friends. I hated this speech. To be honest, it was just plain disrespectful. The man spoke for how long? Two minutes. Two measly minutes, friends. You would think that the American president should be able to speak for longer than two measly minutes. As if that's not bad enough, though, uh, friends. He couldn't even use his own words. Could not even use his word for a 250-word speech today. He said all men are created equal. Where's that from? The Declaration of Independence. The Declaration, friends. Steals that line right out of there. As if that's not bad enough, though. He also steals the first line of the Constitution. And everyone knows what that is. Yes, everyone? We the people. Yes, he steals those three words, changes them around, hoping that you wouldn't notice. He said, for the people, by the people, of the people. By the end of this speech, I was sick and tired of hearing about the people, friends. It was awful. <laughs> Needless to say, it was just disrespectful. You know what I mean? The man is slapping the boys who fought here in the face by only talking for two minutes. The only person that I talked today who actually enjoyed the speech was who? Does anyone know? <laughs> Mr. Everett loved this speech. And Mr. Everett got done when Mr. Lincoln got done, stood up, walked over and shook his hand and said, Mr. Lincoln, you were able to do in two minutes 
what I was unable to do in over two hours. Shook his hand, volunteered his services to go on a campaign speaking to us for Mr. Lincoln today. <coughs> Friends, I, say, I think it's safe to say that Mr. Evans lost his mark. Um, the man is going insane if he sees any genius in this speech whatsoever. And God help us if he gets that man re-elected in 1864. I know that you people are as frustrated as I am with this war. We've been in this war for how long, friends? Three years. Two years. Three years. Coming up on three years. The fact of the matter is, I am sure that every single one of you has family members, you have friends, relatives that we are fighting. This war is getting us nowhere. It is getting us nowhere, friends. And in my opinion, it is time we let the South go. Let them go. We, we, we are losing too many men, to be perfectly honest. Now, there is one line that I do think will live on for me, forever in Mr. Lincoln's speech. I want to share that with you, but real quick. Do, well, first of all, friends, are we going to print up the speech in its entirety in our paper tomorrow? No. Yeah. We will. We will. Because, again, it's only 250 words, friends. That's a paragraph. I can throw that in the middle there. No one's even going to notice it. We might give it one comment. Although the comment that I'd love to make uh, is, the cheeks of every American should turn red and blush at the silly remarks of our American president. Because uh, a man from Chicago gave me that quote. It was amazing. Uh, I simply wish we could throw that in there, but we, we, we will not. We are a very pro-Republican paper. As such, friends, the one line that I do believe I want you to take away forever from this speech today, and uh, from everything that we've learned today, is this. It says, the world will little know nor long remember what we say here. Because no one's ever going to remember Lincoln's speech, friends. Mark my words that it's going to die when the man does, and God help us if anything should happen to that speech. I can't even imagine what this country would become if people had to memorize it or some nonsense. <laughs> Can you imagine what the wretched would be heaven? Good heavens. Now, does anyone have any other questions? I am ashamed of you all! Good heavens! What's the second rule of being a good reporter? <laughs> At least you've learned that! That's it! Class dismissed! I will see you in New York! Thank you. Thank you so much, <laughs> There's a couple of things I do want to clear up real quick. The first of which, he does get a few things wrong. Uh, the fact of the matter is that I can't talk about more modern things because they don't exist yet. But the first fact is that we talked about Confederates being buried on the field. The simple fact of the matter is that they were left on the field. They were left on the field. Confederates were left on the field until 1870. 1875. That's close to 10 years after this battle, before they even start to be removed. The only reason they were removed is because women's groups from the South start organizing trips up this way to reclaim bodies for the South. Now, the problem being, friends, what they'll do is they, if a family wants a body back in Mississippi, they'll grab a body, they'll say it's who you want, send it home. But they don't know who they got. They, about 10 years later, you don't know who you got. They just say it's your son, they send it home. Uh, and that's who they buried down there. A majority of the bodies were taken down to Hollywood Cemetery in Richmond, Virginia putting the ground down there. The problem being, friends, that they are in a massive grave down there as well, because again, you don't know who you got. What they did do is they did put a pyramid down there, and I believe they have the names of every Confederate that they think they lost during this battle. As such, they're on a big pyramid down there, memory pyramid, and a massive grave. Now, the other problem is that, friends, these graves were not marked on the field. As such, there could be anywhere between 10 and 200 bodies still out there on the field. Uh, there very well could be. We don't know that we got everybody off. Um, and, you know, the last body we did find here was in 1998, uh, down in the railroad cut. And we do believe it was a Mississippi man, but again, there is no way to do DNA testing or anything like that. There's nothing left. Just bones. Uh, and by that time, you know, we, we can't trace it back. Yes? Why do you say, you think that it's from uh, Mississippi? Because uh, Mississippi boys took a heavy casualty rating in the, in the railroad cut. It's a very steep incline. They can't get out of the hills, and so Union boys are kind of firing down. Okay. So that's, that's why we assume that it's from there. Now, the other thing that we did talk about is that Lincoln's speech was not very well liked. A lot of people don't realize this, is that when Lincoln gave the address, he wasn't a popular man. He wasn't the president that we like to think of him as today. He was very much glorified in his death, which is why a lot of people believe that the speech gained so much popularity. Um, really, if, if Lincoln doesn't die, who knows, the speech might not have become famous. Um, the other thing is that the speech itself doesn't really gain a lot of fame until the 1900s, uh, until really the turn of the centuries when everyone says, this is an amazing speech, you need to know what it is. Um, and that's, that's why it does gain, gain a lot of popularity. But Mr. Lincoln, a good analogy for, for those of you that are current with today's times, if, if you were to tell someone in 1860 that Lincoln's face was going to be on a dollar bill or on a coin, they would have laughed at you. They would have said that's like putting George W. on a dollar bill. <laughs> <laughs> Just to give you an idea, that's how absurd it sounded to them. Um, it was awful. That's the simple fact of the matter is. But uh, nonetheless, the fact of the matter is, too, also, um, oh, goodness, where were they going? I totally lost my train of thought. Well, uh, I, I can't remember. I, I totally lost my thought. Oh, oh, a national cemetery. Totally lost. Fact is that that is the first national cemetery up there, uh, in our, uh, that you'll see up in the cemetery up here. 
First one that we ever had in this entire country, even before Arlington. Even though Arlington is a great practical joke, um, it is not <laughs> It is not the first cemetery. For those of you that do not know, does anyone know how Arlington got started? Yes. What, what was it? It was part well, of the... It, it was the home place of uh, Robert E. Robert E. Lee's home place. And they didn't want him coming back there. Well, so that's they started, true. They started so good. what's a better way to get back at the general who said no to, to leading your army? Uh, they dig his front yard up and put bodies there. But he did Great, it was his wife. great practice though. Yes. Uh, but the fact is that that the Louis family did sue the American government after, <laughs> after and they won big time. So we, we still are paying off the Louis family, just for record. Uh, but nonetheless, the fact is that is our only, our first national cemetery up there. At the time, it was the only one as well. As such, only Union boys are buried up there. There are no Confederates allowed to be buried in that cemetery, which is why you look through it. There, we do know that some are buried there purely by accident. Um, but the fact is, you know, we, we can't tell you who they are. We only know of a few that we know for sure that are not and that are not Union men. Now, the other thing that you need to realize is that this Civil War was so intense. And to say the term casualty is a very big number here. We say 50,000 men were killed, captured, or wounded during this battle. Not all of those 50,000 men died. It's a, it's a very unique term that we use. 10,000 boys that we talked about died here during Gettysburg. 10,000 boys in pretty much three days and the weeks that follow. 10,000 men. 30,000 men are wounded. Uh, they, they go on to survive. Another 10,000 men are captured. They're sent to prisons or they're never heard from again. Or their bodies are blown so far out of proportion that we can't tell who you are. Uh, they're just pieces. So that could be another 10,000 men that are dead as a result of this battle. We don't know for sure. The simple fact of the matter is that, that 10,000 boys in three days, that number is so astronomically high, um, it's, it's very hard for us to comprehend that number. To, to put it in today's terms, a lot of people use the, the, the tool Facebook. Now, it's said that every Facebook user has an average of about 120 friends. You're going to need 10 people to even make up 1,000. Uh, really, you know, 9 or 10 people to make up 1,000 people. I mean, that's ridiculous. Uh, 10,000 men... To put that in perspective, if you take every military engagement that we've been in in the last 20 years, combine them all together with all of our casualties, the number doesn't even top 5,000. That we lose in three days here, 10,000. 10,000. High enough. Yes. So Antietam is still worse than Gettysburg. Antietam is the bloodiest single day. We are the bloodiest battle. Uh, they lose about 20,000 men in Antietam. Um, casualty rate. We lose about 20. We got really close. On one of the days here, it's either the second or third, we come close to that number. Uh, very close. We flirt with it, but we don't actually break the number. And as such, Antietam is still the bloodiest day. We are the bloodiest battle because we do last three days. Now, the other thing you need to realize is that if that we had a civil war in today's society, the, the casualty rating would be 6.5 million men. Pretty much every man in the state of Virginia, uh, by comparison. That's a lot of people. Uh, you got to understand how astronomically huge this war was. They are fighting friends, family, relatives. They hated this war. Uh, they had every reason not to like Lincoln. As of, that became a problem, though, because years later, of course, when Lincoln's speech finally did gain popularity, um, the simple fact of the matter is that we didn't know where he spoke. They didn't put down a plaque or a marker for a speech that no one liked. Why would you do that? He's stealing benches. He has a children's program. Don't worry. He's, he's a good guy. <laughs> but the fact of the matter is that, that this photograph just recently surfaced. This is actually what we learned about in the last five years or so. This photograph, if you look around, I can pass a few of these around here. The simple fact of the matter is that we had this photograph for about 150 years. It's in the National Archives. If people can share, that'd be great. Pass a few of these down here. Is that a recent discovery? It's a recent discovery because two women were searching through the National Archives, and what they did was they managed to find a photograph here, and it looked pretty familiar. Uh, we could tell that it was definitely in the, na uh, in the Civil War era, of course. And of course what happened was, uh, if you look at it, you'll see a platform in the middle there. That is actually a picture of the dedication ceremony back on November 19th, 1863. Now, as such, there you go, no problem. As such, if you look there, you'll see an archway off to the left. Where we've told people for about 150 years, really, is that Lincoln spoke at the main monument of the cemetery, Soldiers National Monument. The fact of the matter is, though, that that is not true. Uh, we, we learned from that picture, literally just given to us in the last five years, that the, the speech actually took place at Evergreen Cemetery. Uh, there was no fence lining the cemetery there. Evergreen was a very small cemetery back then. But what you'll notice is that that archway right there, if you go up to the main monument up in the cemetery up here, line it up with the monument, you won't see the archway. You turn behind you about a 45 degree angle, line it up with the fence, and hold the top left corner up with your thumb, line it up, you'll see the archway that's in that picture right there. There's a little flagpole around the spot where we believe Lincoln gave the address, but again, we do not know for sure. It wasn't even until we had that photograph 
in the last three to five years that we really started saying it. Uh, really, my first year here was the first year we could really approximate where it was. So. But if you have any other questions, again, it has been my honor to talk about the battlefield with you. Uh, please, please, please take part in the other programs we have going on today. Again, you do pay for them every April 15th. Uh, so you might as well get your money. Uh, now on top of that, uh, have a great day here. If you have any questions, once again, it has been my honor. My name is Nick Lorenz, and have a great day here today. Thank you. I like that outfit, boy. <laughs> wow. Actually, if you'd like to, you can take that, too. It's, it's kind of a map of the cemetery as well. No problem. Oh, here. Yeah.